Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen campus here in Hong Kong. Our premier location in Asia, representing U Chicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. This evening, we're launching a series we call Pop Asia, which will address events, trends, and cultural phenomenon that originate in Asia and impact the rest of the world. Tonight, we begin the first of a three-part mini-series focused on non-fungible token art, or NFT art. On March 11th, a monumental digital collage was offered as a single lot sale and marked two industry firsts. Christie's as the first major auction house to offer a purely digital work with a unique NFT, and the first to accept cryptocurrency, in this case, Ether, in addition to standard forms of payments for the piece. Noah Davis, head of digital sales at Christie's in New York, who will be our guest on next week's program said, acquiring Beeple's work is a unique opportunity to own an entry in the blockchain itself created by one of the world's leading digital artists. Tonight's guest, Tubador, and his art-focused cryptocurrency fund, Metapurse, was the buyer of Beeple's work every day's the first 5,000 days for 69.3 million US dollars. Both finance and art worlds have been captivated by this headline for weeks, and our scholars at the University of Chicago, representing both disciplines, are here with us tonight. NFTs are fascinating in the way that they intersect with technology, cryptocurrencies, art, a centuries old industry, provenance, and even legal issues. It moves us to ask questions like, what makes good art? How is the digital world and digital currency transforming economies, democratizing societies, and with NFTs, supporting artists? Can the longstanding institutional norms of these art industry withstand the disruption of these borderless worlds, among many other questions? Our guest has thought deeply about many of these questions. So let's get started. As always, we'll take questions from the audience in the Zoom chat box. My intros are brief tonight, but for more detailed uh, introductions, you can click on the name on the hyperlink on our event page. Matthew Jesse Jackson is chair of the Department of Visual Arts and a Western art historian at the University of Chicago. He teaches courses grounded primarily in contemplation of cultural experience since 1945. Most of his work of the preceding decade, often produced with collaborators as Our Literal Speed, has been dedicated to investigating how lectures and texts might manifest wisdom and knowledge. Professor Jackson has won numerous awards for his work and his research has been supported by fellowships and grants from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Getty Research Institute, and many others. Professor Ho Guo is the Fuji Bank and Heller Professor of Finance, University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He's also the director of the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics in China, University of Chicago, the special term Alibaba Foundation Professor, Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management, Senior Fellow at Asia Bureau of Finance and Economic Research, and a member of the Council Advisors for the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Professor Hua is interested in the implications of agency frictions and debt maturities in financial markets, and macroeconomics with a special focus on contract theory and banking. His recent research focuses on the role of financial institutions in the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, and he teaches an elective MBA course, Chinese Economy and Financial Markets. Professor Hua has also been writing academic articles on new progress in the area of cryptocurrency and blockchains. And finally, our guest Tubador is content strategist, communications professional, and steward of Metapurse the largest NFT fund in the world. Tubador, welcome. We're delighted to have you join us this evening and I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks so much, Mark. The, the delight is mine. This is an honor. I'm happy to share a perspective of uh, the NFT space and crypto in general for your consideration. Now, 
uh, I am obviously a misfit on this panel, and uh, I think I have understood my <laughs> my role in this panel. I think I am to be the comic relief, while the actual experts take apart my <laughs> theories about uh, economics and art, brick by brick. So onwards. For starters, I thought we would uh, address the elephant in the room, and by that I I do not. That is not a reference to my body mass index. Uh, I thought we could get started with the $69 million we spent on this JPEG. Let's take a moment to reflect on the aftermath of this event, shall we? I think it's safe to say that it made the news. Uh, it sparked a proper conversation about digital art, and it also opened a Pandora's box of skepticism around a lot of things that happened around this event. There were questions over the legitimacy of the sale, uh, over the transaction, whether it was an effort in wash trading, whether it was art at all, whether it was a marketing stunt, that one still flummoxes me. $69 million is a lot to spend on marketing without a product or a service that we are selling. And uh, is it a cash grab? Initially, we at Metapurse didn't quite understand the, the vitriol. I mean, we get it. Uh, this is no Salvatore Mundi in terms of uh, conventional artistic accomplishment, but then, this is no Salvatore Mundi in terms of provenance either. We know that we got the right JPEG for the $69 million we paid. The NFT is on the blockchain. The tra transactions are on blockchain and we paid in crypto in Ethereum and the money is real. We realized later on that this might have been an expression of disbelief. This decidedly historic event upended or well, at the very least dented three very durable perceptions. The first perception is probably digital art is not art. Well, neither was installation art or graffiti at some point. And I'll wager that the shift from cave painting to canvas was not a smooth transition either. The second perception that I think it dented is that crypto is a fad. Now with a market cap of $2 trillion and growing and with a user base of over hundred million people, I think that statement no longer holds water. And the third perception, interestingly enough, and which we didn't set out to break or even to consider was wealth building and patronage and cultural taste making are Caucasian pursuits. Now, what's the source of all of these newfangled ideas? And why don't I show my face? Well, for one, my face is the least interesting aspect of this uh, conversation, as you'll see in just a minute. I'm Troubadour, and over the last year or so, I've found that this real identity of mine, just Anand, I call myself, is completely irrelevant to the pseudonymous economy I'm now part of. What is the pseudonymous economy, you ask? Well, this is a, uh, an idea posited very recently uh, and persistently by Balaji Srinivasan. What it basically says is that we will go on to have different identities uh, for different aspects of our lives, different earning names, for instance, speaking names and official or real identities. Our real names are not built for the internet. They are simply handles, as Balaji would say, for a file cabinet for the government or for a database. Now, if your bank account is your uh, stored wealth, your real name is your stored reputation. Only you can debit your bank account, but anyone can debit your reputation. Uh, the concept of pseudonymity itself is not new. I mean, uh, you can be an anon on Reddit for a really long time. Uh, you have to use your real name on Facebook. But in between these two, there can be a persistent pseudonym. Any gamer, anybody familiar with the gaming space, anybody who has a PS4 <clears throat> or an Xbox at home or kids that use them know that the first thing you do is to create a username, uh, a pseudonym for yourself. You use it locally or you can use it globally. But then... When, when the blockchain came into being, a kind of pseudonym like I use now, tubadur.eth, which is built on the internet, enables you to earn with a pseudonym. It not only gives you freedom to uh, say what you want to, or freedom to exist, or freedom to do things that you don't want overlapping onto the other identities of your life, you can also start to earn on the internet. Uh, besides, real names give off too much about yourself, right? People can practically uh, stalk you. Uh, on the internet. And 
pseudonyms on the internet, uh, especially uh, in the blockchain space are programmable and rebootable. So those who are scared of asking questions, for instance, uh, pseudonyms can be an excellent way to break the ice and, and to uh, really get in there without fear of repercussions and so on. Where do we come from is the next obvious question. So uh, we bought this, uh, the $69 million piece. We uh, exist in the pseudonymous economy. Where does all of this live? Uh, and how do you access it? Uh, is it accessible only via complex uh, tech, like a VR headset? Do you have to cloister yourself uh, uh, in some place or lock yourself up in Siberia or beside um, you know, a, a hydro power plant? Not really. The metaverse is the pseudonymous economy. It's accessible via just a browser. Let me show you. This is Decentraland, and that's my avatar within Decentraland. Right? This is what I look like. And this is the B20 monument. We built this space in Decentraland. What is so special about it? You have seen a lot of gaming worlds. You've seen a lot of... Uh, examples of uh, uh, digital spaces like Second Life. What sets virtual worlds in the blockchain apart is that every piece of land here gives you inalienable ownership. If you own a plot of land in Decentraland, it can't be taken away from you. If you own a gaming asset here, it can't be taken away from you at all. So that's what sets this apart. And as you can see, it's accessible via uh, just a browser link. If you want, you can have a more immersive experience uh, with your we are headsets and so on. But this particular building, we built as uh, a sort of a monument for the first set of people's single edition uh, everydays, which we bought way back in December. Where else am I? I also wanted to show you uh, a little bit of art, something that's typical of uh, crypto art. Now, digital art, uh, obviously is nat digital native art fits perfectly with, uh, within the crypto space. This particular platform takes it one step higher. This is called async art or asynchronous art. This is one of the first instances of programmable art. What you see in front of you is the master layer of day night, which is a uh, piece by the artist Rutger van der Tass. And let that sink in a little bit. This is a layered work of art, which means there is this master layer it is composed of several layers that come together to make this master. And these are some of those layers. The beauty is that each of these layers and the master are all NFTs. And each of these layers have different states of being. And this is the most interesting layer of the lot, the day-night the day -night coordinates, for instance. Whoever controls this layer can control the day or night settings according to the time zone that he lives in. And Metacoven, since he was based out of Singapore, is set to the Singapore day and night uh, you know, time zone. So whenever you look at the master layer now, which is accessible online, uh, of course, it is set to the Singapore time zone the first time. So there are a lot of these examples that are, uh, that are blossoming and sort of mushrooming all over the crypto space. And that's, that's kind of where I come from. This is just a, a tiny peek of uh, what I've been doing and and the, and the milieu from which I come from. So uh, I won't take up any more of your time. <clears throat> As I said, my role on this panel is very clear. May I invite Professor Jigua Her to take apart my thesis? Great introduction. Um, you know, these are the gaming world that I had a long memory for, uh, although that I'm being away for also for 20 years, but uh, that, Give me fresh memory. Uh, I I would like to just uh, um, raise two or three questions and uh, more or less you know do what uh, can can respond and also you know can comment on the first thing that uh, I believe that most of our audience would, would like to know you know your view of the difference between this the Bitcoin Ether all these things a cryptocurrency and this uh, NFT. Because that's the you know first the question coming out of why this is a new stuff again and then then what's the next right what so so can you tell us the logic behind it? Sure, 
The difference is uh, in the very name itself, uh, Professor. Uh, currencies or tokens like Bitcoin or Ethereum are fungible. They work just like any other global currency. One Bitcoin is equal to another, uh, just like one dollar is equal to another. Non-fungible tokens, on the other hand, are not fungible. They are unique digital assets in and as themselves. And an NFT is basically a digital pointer, a certificate of ownership, if you will, which can be linked to any digital asset. Right? For instance, you can have an NFT for a piece of land. You can have an NFT for a work of art. You can have an NFT for uh, you know, 10 seconds of music. You can have an NFT for uh, any of these things. So that makes them rather more resilient and keeps them away from the volatility that typically grips uh, the crypto uh, economy and rather sort of shifts the focus away uh, in terms of value. Now, here's where it gets inter interesting. There's a, there's a tiny bit of convergence when it comes to value. How do you calculate the value of uh, you know, any digital asset, whether it's Bitcoin or uh, you know, these uh, NFTs? Now, I'd say value comes from narrative as much as it does uh, from the asset that is backing a particular currency, right? Even today, what gives the US dollar its value is not necessarily a gold reserve. We moved away from that in the 70s, right? What gives it its value is a global reputation in a sense. And Bitcoin is not too different from that. If you look at it, what gives Bitcoin its value is not its technical composition or its built-in scarcity. It's this incredible origin story. Think about the opening of a documentary, for instance, about Bitcoin. Uh, it might... Uh, open with something of say from the ashes of uh, global financial ruin in 2008, rose this new economic alternative created by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, who then walked off into the sunset, neither claiming credit nor the upside from his creation. So that sort of a mythical origin story is what gives it its value. And that's held true for all of the phenomena in the digital space, in the blockchain space ever since. And it's even more so in the NFT space. So coming back to uh, the difference between these two, all of the phenomena in crypto, starting with Bitcoin, altcoins, the ICO phenom, and DeFi are now all under the hood. And the primary vehicle that is driving crypto forward will be the NFT space. The reason that will happen is because NFTs are more visi visible, they are more vivid, they are driven by culture. And that is going to be the primary driver going forward. Any other innovation from now on is going to be under the hood. And what you see in front of you is going to be NFTs. Thank you. Um, so the part of the reason that I'm asking is, uh, here's one in my mind uh, as a, a intrinsic uh, uh, um, kind of a, a puzzle, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a dilemma, is that uh, the reason that uh, I believe that uh, the cryptocurrency is valuable, as you said, is uh, this, uh, you know, people call it trust, people call it, uh, you know, narrative, you call it, it's just all the same in the sense that uh, I hold it because other people want it kind of logic. Uh, and that requires uh, lots of th things like fungibility in the sense that I can, I can use it many times or kind of like it's a similar thing so that uh, um, in other words, it's called a liquidity. These terms are often the time like just fungible itself. Now the, the, the NFT by its nature is a very unique. It gives it, it uh, in a sense that, uh, you know, or the ownership of very unique things so that you can stand out to, mm -hmm. you know, bragging yourself to, to other people. I think that's a very important part of it, right? You are the owner of that piece of very unique stuff. But then all of a sudden you get into bigger issue of that uh, what if other people don't like it or you know over time you know that thing why do we need to value it so it's just that you have this intrinsic but, dilemma associated mm. with this concept how do you think about that there is no dilemma to be honest i mean uh, if you approach nfts as an asset class and look at it purely from a financial eye uh, it's going to be very difficult first off there is not enough historical data about the value of NFTs and the pricing of NFTs to arrive at any strong model, right? Uh, 
so the, it forces you to engage with the culture, with the Renaissance, as, as I call it. I'm, I'm sorry I'm banding about very colorful words, but that's the kind of uh, setting the NFT movement itself is born from. So you, you, have, you are forced to engage with the community, with the culture, with a lot of the creators and artists who are moving this space forward and creating these different asset classes to be able to truly evaluate the NFT that you're about to buy. That said, how do you contend with the dilemma of, is it going to be valuable tomorrow? Is don't buy it to be able to flip it tomorrow or the day after. Just like uh, the, the advice for crypto in general is don't spend more than you can afford to lose, right? That holds good even for the NFT space. With the one difference that if your token, the token that you, uh, you know, spent a lot of money in crashes, you're left with nothing. But if there is no market for your brand of NFTs, you still have that piece of art. You still have that plot of virtual hand. You still have something in you, which you bought because you connected with it at some level and not just because it, you might be able to flip it tomorrow. That makes sense. That, that, that too, a lot of certain, um, for the picture that you were showing me, especially the second one, I enjoy the second one. The first one, I'm not that sure, but uh, in, enjoy very much the, the second one, you know, remind me a lot of cultural layers. It's interesting. Now I have my third question is my last question is a little bit more towards this is that last night I was just, you know, preparing our conversation. I went on the YouTube and the typing that how do I create an NFT by myself? Tons of uh, YouTube video comes out and I saw a guy just showing me that how do I do it? I mean, more or less it's just, uh, you know, reminds me when I was a college student, I get to the first time getting to see something called a computer. And it then tells me, how do I put the, all these pens? Um, this is a software pen, right? Just moving around and put it together and uh, that you could do it. So I worry that uh, this type of, uh, you know, pop culture um, together with the art, which uh, makes me that, uh, yeah, you, you you can create something and you own something, but because of the production itself is so, so kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> anybody can do it. You know, I, I understand a lot of time that that's a good thing, but uh, when you get into this art idea, I worry about whether this is a, um, you know, too easy to create it so that, uh, you know, everything is really rely on so-called uh, narrative. And uh, to be honest, uh, fundamentally, I feel that that thing, again, there's a little bit of dilemma uh, behind it. Can you comment on that? Sure. I mean, creating an NFT is very simple. You're right. But creating good art is never easy. Uh, to be able to tell the difference between good art and bad art and art that uh, is high effort art and low effort art shouldn't be that difficult, to be honest. It requires a little bit of study uh, a little bit of awareness of history and of the artists that have come in the space and have worked here for uh, for the last many, many years. That amount of effort, I think, is uh, is due to anybody that has any interest in being able to buy art. This is what an open market feels like, right? This is almost like a, a souk from centuries ago. You never know exactly what you're going to get. You don't know which, which bit is counterfeit or which bit is real. You need to do your own uh, research irrespective and to expect some sort of a hand holding here opens the doors again to gatekeepership which would completely destroy uh, the experience again part of the experience is to maybe stumble a few times and and learn some of these uh, tricks yourself i always believe that you know the the goal of the nft space is not to go mainstream it never has been if that were the case if you know uh, uh, a high-end UX was always uh, the end goal, this level of innovation wouldn't have been possible. A tiny bit of friction makes you aware of the inherent risks in the blockchain space. You know the idea that you need to preserve your uh, private keys, that uh, you know you shouldn't give away your seed phrases, or how to maintain your crypto wallet and so on. That part is is a necessary tiny bit of learning curve before you plunge into the crypto space. And when it comes to trying to acquire or engage with assets that you think you love, you ought to do your research. That 
I mean, that should be the message for everybody and not expect to, uh, you know, plunge in and uh, land on a soft bed. I think it's a good time to having Matthew here to, you know, I was deliberately putting the last question a little bit towards art. Matthew, that's your well turn. Yeah, uh, a lot to say. Uh, don't even know where to start. Thank you so much uh, to, for teeing up the ball there. Um, let me just assert two things straight off. Uh, seems to me that there's, uh, I, I really respect what you're doing. I think it's, it's um, there's no doubt that there's one huge pro, at least conceptually, to what you're talking about. And that to me is, at least conceptually, if we take out all sorts of caveats about environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of different caveats, it's an egalitarian structure that people around the globe could potentially be involved with. So on that, on that level, it seems to me that that's a pro. It means that you don't have to deal with the gallery structure as it currently exists. It means that you don't have to deal with, the, as you said, gatekeepers, you don't have to... Uh, somebody can upload something in one part of the world, somebody in another part of the world can appreciate it. If they like it, they can get it and uh, they can uh, pump up the person who made the original thing. That all seems great, at least conceptually. Uh, the biggest problem with NFT art would seem to be the art part. That, that's where there are some problems from my point of view. Of course, I'm a gatekeeper. So I'm going to analyze the art and I'm going to say, well, your presentation right this second is better than 99.8% of the art that I've seen in the NFT space. The, the, well, the stuffed animals, the stuffed animals in the background, the, you know, you're, you're, you are one person, you become another. It's great, it's excellent. I mean, I would buy that NFT. On the other hand, the NFTs that are ostensibly art, no doubt they're great, but and I'll, I, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but I am reminded of like the, um, the Ayn Rand uh, remark that, uh, you know, uh, Atlas Shrugged is philosophy for people who don't read philosophy. Well, NFT art, a lot of people in my branch of the area are going to say is like art for people who just haven't been here before a whole lot interested in art, which there's nothing wrong with that. But it does mean that there are going to be some issues. So... That's just my first, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't find anything to disagree with in that, Matthew, to be honest. I mean, you don't like 99%. You should be my boss, and I'm open to that possibility. So just to put that on the table. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, let me say a few other things. 95% of the art out there is bad anyway. So if 95% of the NFT art is bad, hey, you're not losing anything. You're basically running as well as most of the things. But uh, the question I would have is, uh, is it problematic that the art exists in a place where um, that's cl much closer? I know you, this is inside baseball for art, but Thomas Kincaid, who I consider mm -hmm. one of the great artists of the 20th century, the painter of light, uh, he supposedly his paintings were in one out of every 20 households in the United States. I don't know that that's true, but nobody would immediately say that's absurd. You'd say, well, it could be, maybe. Uh, does this, this to me seems to exist kind of in that place in so much as, as that is mall art that people can, a lot of times you walk into the mall and they turn up the lights on the painting so that the painting glows, kind of cool. Uh, yeah. So if it's, if it's existing in those kinds of places, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's great. And I think it's fantastic. I was immediately going on there and thinking, you know, how can I get some NFTs and sell high? But one thing that differentiates me from probably you is that it's never occurred to me to be worried about the authenticity of art. I don't care. I, it just doesn't you matter. No, mm -mm. no. I've never worried one minute about whether the art was authentic or not because I don't own it. <laughs> I just look at it. I just like to look at it and talk about it. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it matters to you only if, if, if you go about trying to own it, right? Only then it, it becomes of paramount importance. Otherwise, most of the art yeah. I've looked at, you, I mean, even uh, the, the age old argument about uh, digital art versus uh, real art, right, on, on a canvas is 
you can't touch it. They say you don't touch art in any place. You're not supposed to. You, you just look at it. I'm on your side. Yeah. In a certain setting. You know, it, what, what you just said raises uh, two questions, uh, Matthew. Yeah. One of them is pragmatic. The other one's a little abstract. Okay. The pragmatic one, obviously, is that, I mean, not a question as such, maybe an observation. Sure. I think the medium and technology uh, do influence how uh, art is experienced or even created, sure. right, uh, to, a, yeah, sure. to a large degree. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I recently watched, uh, you know, incidentally, as things would have it, a YouTube video, which a friend of mine shared with me about art in the age of Instagram. You know, more than 90%, uh, 95% of museums now allow photography, which was not a phenomena even uh, five years ago or six years ago, right? I mean, we, we have the, and installation art has grown to create these spaces for photography, the, the museum of eggs, for instance, of pizza, of ice cream, of feelings or, or, or of dreams. Uh, yeah. and there, there have been nice uh, precedents for it, like uh, the Rema by James Terrell or a Confrontation by uh, Louise Bourgeois or the Embankment by uh, Rachel White Reed or Kusama's Obliteration Room and so on. So okay. these are all, I suppose, you know, the, the effect of medium and technology changing the way art is experienced and created. We're going to see a lot more of those than, yeah. uh, you know, a previous generation of art. That's one. The other question, and this is a very dangerous question to ask, is... Yeah. What is art? Now, any discussion with artists, right? Any conversation with artists always, you know, it, it's very uh, innocuously begins. They're very nice to you. You, you keep talking. First off, if you're in a conversation with artists, you are outnumbered. Even if it's just one artist and 20 of you, you're outnumbered, right? It all leads to this one uh, sort of uh, snare of a question, which is what is art? You get stuck there. It's almost impossible to answer. Sure. Artists live in that zone, but when you're looking at it from a, a commercial perspective or from uh, the perspective of framing or structure or yeah. in, in how to sort of put it in a box and showcase it, you're lost at that stage. So I think uh, in one sense, I, I completely agree that a lot of art out there is, is, is redundant, it's reductive. That is the case. But then there are these gems, these diamonds in the rough, which embrace the technology and like the one that I just showed you, they are crypto native. They don't just have motifs that uh, that speaks to uh, uh, to Bitcoin or blockchain or have one big uh, Bitcoin symbol in there, but try and infuse the actual ideology uh, in that art and try to tell a story through the technology. That's what I'm looking at, and that's what most most art aficionados or or people who love art ought to be looking at. So what if you have to you know uh, you know sort of. Uh, uh, swim through the weeds and, and pick through uh, a lot of drivel to reach there. But there is gold here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm about at the end of my uh, allotted time. But I, when, there are a few things that you say that I think I totally want to agree with. And I think you're completely right. Uh, it's absolutely art. There's no question about it. it. Is it going to be museums? No question about that. But to me, the, the question is what kind of art will be in the museums in 100 years? I, I'll give you a heads up if you're an investor. It needs to be art that does not look like art. The problem with NFT art right now is it looks a lot like art. Ergo, it looks like art from about 150 years ago. So the key is whoever makes the black square of NFT art, I'm going to make that later today, by the way, uh, that person's going to make a lot of money or at least the person who runs. I think. Mm -hmm. So Mark, am I supposed to bring you in? You can bring me in. Okay, you're on the <laughs> stage. Come on, I'm back. Uh, yeah. Bring Jirgua to the Jirgua, uh, come on in. Well, um, it was it's interesting to listen to you all uh, talk about this subject. And uh, just off the back of what uh, Matthew just said, um, Tubador, um, is this art? Have you you've watched this now over a period of some time? Is the art evolving and getting better? Um, and are, can we expect it only to get better? Like the conversation that we had. Um, leading into the program um, when I started on the internet many, many, many years ago, um, it was a struggle, um, but it got better over time to the point where we're at um, 5G speeds now. So what, what, do you, what do you see as the future of uh, NFT art in terms of its quality? That's a trick question if I ever heard one, Mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Don't answer that question. The, the, the one thing that uh, I understood <laughs> from, from what uh, Matthew was saying is that uh, something evolving and something getting better are two very different things, right? 
art has evolved but according to matthew uh, 99% of it is drivel right now so i'm sure that it will continue to evolve along with the platform but will it get better that that will remain subjective until the end of time i believe but the more native art gets to the platform and to the medium that it embraces i think the better it gets quite simply that leads to some questions we have so many questions uh, leading into the program uh, and we have many that are coming in right now um, yes. One of the questions we talked about um, prior to the event was um, about the licensing possibilities for the art and what do you do with the art or what can you do other than creating a museum or a monument um, to actually monetize uh, the, the NFT art that you're acquiring? Hmm. Programmability of NFTs open up so many doors. And the reason why you have the sudden influx, not just of collectors, but of artists in the space, is that it, uh, it completely uh, changes the conventional economic models around art in the real world. I mean, artists have been fighting for royalties for the longest time, and they can be programmed into these NFTs, and they are being accepted as a norm in all of these art places. So any uh, you know, art marketplace, if an artist resells the art or somebody resells it, 10% of the proceeds go back to the artist as royalties. And we've seen, seen that happen time and time again. And that's, that's one of the foundational pieces, uh, foundational reasons why artists gravitate towards crypto art in the first place. And that, that's very interesting, right? It, we, it also reminds us that this entire ecosystem is built on crypto on top of these financial instruments, which are then infused into uh, you know, all of these cultural elements. To that point, and I'll ask one question and then I'll turn it over to Jirgua and Matthew to ask additional questions. Um, you, One of the things that touched me about the, when the first time we talked was the fact that you said that this isn't just about buying a piece of um, NFT art for 69 million um, and that you have a vision for wanting to help artists. And you started to touch on that, but do you have specific plans for helping artists uh, going forward that you care to share? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, this is a conversation that keeps us up at night, Metacoven and I. Uh, I mean, uh, as Matt, you can attest, and as, as you can too, as, uh, as a collector for many, many years, conversations with artists tend to change you in very fundamental ways, in how you look at life, how you uh, approach it, and so on. So we keep asking ourselves this question. There are three probable models in which you can help a community of artists, or at least to uh, preserve it. One is a direct model of patronage. You buy their art. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. The other is to create tiny inflection points like art festivals or museum openings for artists, which sort of create a, a cyclical system of support for artists. The third is to build an institution which enables uh, artists to uh, sort of create a self-sufficient economic ecosystem within themselves. I think we are gravitating towards the, uh, the third model, more like. There are some interesting ideas in the crypto art space, like uh, Dada Art, which is, which is trying to create uh, a community of artists and an economy sort of built into it, uh, a more egalitarian approach. I'm not sure they're there yet, but that's a very interesting idea. The other models are to simply, you know, try and solve the problem of discoverability. Uh, you know, artists, at, uh, at the end of the day, want their art to be showcased somewhere or their story to be told. That is something that we will continue to do via, you know, the Metaverse uh, brand itself and by sort of tying up with other similar efforts in the space, like the Museum of Crypto Art, for instance. So that, that's kind of where our head's at right now. Great. Thank you. Jirgua, you look like I, you questions. Yeah, I, I was just reading through the questions getting in and also uh, I... I think there's one that I asked you when we do the gyron, and also I believe that's really important uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, you know the easy replication, uh, right? So it's touched on the Matthews pointed like where it is coming from. It's also gets to the a very interest, really really cool thing is that it, in my mind if the crypto would like to taking off, like when I say taking off, just not two trillion, 20, probably that means taking off, like some real world thing. How do you link these uh, crypto 
you know, game playing, that kind of thing to the real world. To be honest, 20 years ago, I was very much into these game stuff, but now like I couldn't raise any of my attention to this. Uh, so, so these type of things that I really think that a crypto world has to think hard, that it, how do they make these connections to the NFT is basically, you know, I own this passcode, I understand how to as academia, but that passcode linked to that another passcode or something else on di digital only live there and link these uh, part of the code to something really real so that it prevent other people to either access to it or anything. That's the critical part that make it valuable from my perspective. Yeah, agreed. Professor, uh, they are already inexorably linked. I mean, just earlier in the day, you watched a YouTube video and created an NFT that already puts you in the top 0.1% of the global population. And it's as simple as that. A YouTube video can, can do that to you. But as to how crypto translates in the real world and how NFTs can impact the real world, we have some amazing stories, uh, especially uh, even from the pandemic itself, right? Uh, job loss has been a global issue everywhere. And I know, personally know, at least 25 artists from around the world, uh, uh, whether it's from, uh, from Argentina, uh, Latin America, from the UK, at least three or four of them, who found an alternate source of livelihood, making art. Or there is this uh, person called, uh, who goes by the pseudonym Paradox. He's a cinematographer in the metaverse. That's his job. I mean, his day job is also, he makes videos. But then in the metaverse, uh, you know, the, the view that I just showed you in Decentraland, he goes flying around capturing videos and makes videos out of them. No, so I, are... let me just clarify a bit on this thing is that, you know, I understand that, that you could uh, impact the world. Uh, what I meant is a link, the digital world record to exclusively hmm. to the things in the real world. For instance, yeah. there's a bunch of questions he, uh, in, in the Q&A and I was asking you, Previously, that what if I just replicate the stuff? It's just piece of code, and and I understand that in blockchain world, you're just adding on the time star, time stamp, so that the people recognize that this is created at a different time by different people. By you know, on you know, you can identify them. However, that the content would be the same. The content itself would be the same in that way that I don't see clearly that you basically you have two identical content linked to two different pieces of code, which if I only care about the content, then I would say that they should be the fungible. That's that's what I meant. But I, I, I you know, sort of understand that what you're trying to say, but I would like to give you a chance to just uh, give us a convincing argument of why my logic is flawed. It's not flawed. It's, it's a nice point, uh, uh, Professor. It's just that uh, if a same person, if I create an NFT, uh, you know, and, and call it the Genesis piece, and I create a hundred others, then I'm diluting my own uh, sort of creation, right? You're saying if it is replicable, if say Professor Matthew replicates my NFT, that's not going to hold value, even if he copy paste that same. Well. I think it, it might be pretty valuable. It, it might be more valuable than mine. <laughs> it might not be the same value as what I'm trying to say. I mean, I buy your NFT, but but still, okay. right? The deal. The, Matthew, the please produce of, one and send it to I, me. I'm planning to. If, I, if you I, do, make that I'm leaving right I, now to make that NFT. I got I got better things to do. <laughs> Interesting. Hey. Tubador. <laughs> Tubador, thank you for that, for that vote of confidence. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it, seems, it seems to me that, um, do, do you envision at the end of the day that there will be museums, uh, you know, brick and mortar museums dedicated to NFT art? I'm just curious what your, how you imagine this building out. I mean, it already <laughs> exists kind of to some extent. And there's no question that digital art has already been around for 50, 60 years. On that part, you're 100% guaranteed to be right. It, but but what, how, where do you think it's going to live ultimately? Last week, we had the first uh, uh, NFT uh, exhibition in a physical museum. And I believe it was in Beijing at the UCCA, which uh, I'm told is, is the Eastern equivalent of the MoMA. So I think we're already there. It's inevitable. Uh, they, 
uh, they they had uh, 20 pieces of uh, people on show. They had first supper, which you is mentioned the first Beijing. Art. Yes. Oh, interesting. Beijing uh, allows you to show those things. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Interesting. interesting. <laughs> so we're already there. That's, that leads to one of the questions from the audience um, that I think is a good one here. Totally connected to that point. Mm -hmm. How do you, Tubador, how do you reconcile the undertones of Beeple's work respective to racism and misogyny? Ah, yes, that's an interesting question. Now, we need to understand two things here. Uh, what did we see in that piece is, is something that we get asked a lot, uh, or at least uh, maybe not as directly, but uh, uh, in questions framed like, why did you spend $69 million on a work of art where they actually mean, why would you spend $69 million on that drivel, right? So that's that's the uh, general thing here. Now, what drew us to that particular uh, piece, that, that compendium of 5,000 pieces, is the narrative that it brought again, right? The fact that this one person with an almost spiritual level of consistency kept churning out one work of art every day, consistently for 5,000 days, on his sick days, on his healthy days, on his sad days or happy days, uh, even on the day his wife went into labor, he created uh, one work of art. He didn't miss a single day. And uh, it, uh, we thought it would be a metaphor for this new digital native generation uh, in that you can start anywhere, but if you keep at it with consistency, you hit the end of the rainbow, that at the end of uh, a year or 30, preferably a year. But that's that sort of narrative I thought would be, uh, we thought would be very uh, interesting and, and sort of inspiring to this generation. Uh, are all of those pieces, 5,000 pieces, masterpieces, people would be the first to admit no. Are, will all of them age well? Probably not. Then what is that about? It's about the journey of that individual as an artist and also as a person. Besides, if you're churning out one piece of art a day, where's your inspiration coming from? Uh, people describes himself as a satirist quite often, or almost like a, a, a cartoonist of what's going on around him which makes him a conduit for what's happening around in the world. You know, a sort of an unfiltered conduit to all of the excesses that we see in the culture around, uh, around us in the really fraught uh, socio-political milieu of the US that he exists in. I think his art is a product of all of that stuff. I might be interpreting here, but the fact remains is that, uh, is, is, is people the foremost artist of our generation? he'd be the first one to say no. Are Metacoven and I the, uh, the best connoisseurs of art? Probably not. But then what are we doing? Because we just happen to be there at the same point at that historical moment, as simple as that. None of us planned it to be this way. It's just that we happen to converge at that particular point and this happened. So um, one, one thing I think about um, with yeah. regard to um, NFTs, is the fact that, and I believe this about um, collecting art in the physical world um, as opposed to just the virtual world, that once you collect a piece, you, you start to develop taste and you start to evolve that taste. Is that something that you see that applies here? And you know, shouldn't we encourage more people to collect art even if it is digital so that they develop and, and cultivate taste? I believe so. I think it's more profound than that. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we should encourage people to uh, connect with artists as well, not just the art. Um, I mean, we are all exposed to art, Professor. I mean, you have taken that extra step of going and collecting art. Most people don't. They are influenced by art. It's all around them. They're sort of affected by it, maybe at a subconscious level. But when they want to engage with it, they find that art is typically locked up in an ivory tower and is accessible only to people of means, right? That, that's how we walk around uh, spending our lives in. It, it, it changed very drastically for me when I got into the crypto art space. Speaking with artists suddenly raised my own sense of self-worth. It told me that I was worthy enough to engage with art, to be a patron of art. And that's, that's a very self-affirming uh, feeling. It makes you a better person, I believe. And so that's, that would be the one reason I would want people to get into the digital art space. It gives them access to all of these creators, to all of these artists, and to and the best parts of them. Just to play off of that comment, isn't that one of the problems with the way the art industry is structured today? 
where you do have all of these gatekeepers and the gatekeepers keep you oftentimes from the artist. One of the things that I enjoy most is engaging with artists. They've become some of my best friends. Um, isn't that one of the problems? And are you able to overcome that issue uh, with NFT art? Yes, what I just described is access not to the gatekeepers or to the art platforms, but to the artists directly. Mm -hmm. uh, that access you do have. There's nobody uh, sort of standing in, in between you and uh, you know booking a separate appointment with the artist. You can DM them on Twitter. You can buy uh, you know one of their uh, pieces and you already have an instant connection with them. Matthew, you must have a question, burning question. You must. Yeah, I have so many questions I can't even begin to uh, get started. I, I, I mean, um, it, if we were, it, uh, this massive democratization of art appreciation does seem to be one of the key components of what you're describing. And that yes. it, would, it would mean that I might buy something for $200 and know someone, and I'm kind of supporting their work and I can see all of this. Okay, I, I, can I get, I'll go through the criticisms that I've heard in my area of the art world, which is one is that this is like, uh, I've heard the word crypto bros. I never knew those words until you know, a few weeks ago. So it's a very male thing. The fact that 50% of this panel probably would not be, you know, this gender, situation so hey, i'm in touch with my yeah. feminine side if that helps i don't know <laughs> well it's getting somewhere it's probably more women actually yeah. running it would be an idea um and uh is it is that a perception false that it is an overwhelmingly male space it's not false it's not false it's something that uh, that we need to uh, work hard at correcting we have uh, an excellent group of women artists and uh, they had to form a collective, uh, in fact, uh, to be heard. Uh, it's called the Women of Crypto Art. And there are over 500 women artists in that. And that's a small number, considering a lot of the artists in the space. That is uh, a perception that we need to correct, not a perception, an actuality that we need to fix. And that can only happen when we have more stories coming out of, uh, of women artists. And that's that's a collective uh, problem. It, it's, it's true of all technology. right? And, this, this new space is predominantly built on new technology. So that uh, instantly sort of uh, cordons off uh, a majority of the population. We're trying to correct it. And I think it will happen because this is not a, a tech specific area. NFTs are more culture driven. So it's sort of more open to uh, everybody. I think it will fix itself. Can I ask a, a question? Uh, a little bit different from art, but uh, intrinsically about the you know finance yeah. e economic side. Two two observations. One observation is pointed out by one of the Q and A, saying that the you know the uh, um, seemingly large you know uh, market value or market transaction is driven by underlying currency that uh, it's traded on. For instance, that uh, I bought it uh, one ether long time ago, but uh, now I'm selling it. Or using this same ether to buy it, then but because of the USD dollar price goes up and down, and now it's really high, so it will look like a bigger, right? And uh, this is the first point. The second point is that there is indeed a well-established study in you know in academic world where if you buy a stock and it's going up, then you become less cautious, less you know less careful. You know you feel like you are the winner and less careful in in spending it. So that's like a, you know, a little bit of behavioral bias on that. So, you know, the, the, these two things are obviously, you know, mm. connected. That's why I mentioned together. Third point I would really would like you to, to, to comment on is that uh, when I see it, I worry about the money laundering. Um, mm. This like an anti, you know, this is a standard thing that whenever you talk to a central banker, they the first thing they say that uh, you know crypto will not have future, which is against. You know, I'm very neutral. I I I see both sides, but the uh, regulators are very much to it, and I really worry that NFT actually makes this impression even stronger. Mm. So how do you respond to these mm. things? Oh, um, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, think, this is uh, a little bit tough. <laughs> not really, not really. I mean, I'm I'm more. Uh, 
if I may use the word bullish about crypto surviving than the fiat system. I mean, considering uh, the US printed 20% of all its currency in, uh, in, in like a span of four months, that seems less sustainable to me than Bitcoin's price fluctuations, to be honest. But uh, that apart, your, your uh, behavioral thesis is very true. Uh, yeah. uh, I guess that, you know, once you uh, are on a high, you tend to feel a lot more confident about yourself in, in spending money. That is true, not just in the stock market, but also in the crypto sphere itself. And when it comes to uh, uh, spending the underlying asset, there are two very uh, interesting and, and divergent mindsets, even within the crypto space. There are a lot of people who tend to look at their assets in terms of dollar value. And that is really bad for uh, cardiac health, to be honest, because of all the fluctuation, right? right? One day you're uh, a multimillionaire, the other day you're just a millionaire, and that might cause a lot of trouble uh, in your heart. So I've seen people who have been in this space uh, say in, in excess of uh, um, five years or six years or seven years, tend to consider their assets purely in crypto terms. I'm a crypto millionaire or I have this amount of crypto. They tend to measure their assets only in terms of Ethereum uh, or in terms of their dominant crypto asset. And it keeps them sane. So when they do spend money on, on uh, a particular work of art, only in very specific cases do they try and make that uh, connection between dollar terms and uh, crypto terms, at least very consciously. So they tend to spend a lot of crypto, which is why you see, you know, huge uh, purchases uh, in the from within the crypto space. And it's always uh, reported in dollar terms, but in terms of crypto, uh, it might not be all that much. Can you comment on this uh, money laundering? Because that's to be that that's quite uh, important, to be honest. For sure. Future. I mean, we have uh, we have uh, excellent mechanisms of onboarding and offboarding, uh, right? And regulations are catching up. Uh, they need to, instead of trying to uh, take a linear path, I have a feeling they need to adopt this new technology rather than try to adapt to it at every turn. Because this tech is going to evolve super fast and you can't consider the current tech stack and plan your regulations around it by which it's already obsolete and you're on to the next. So if, if a regulator needs to keep pace with this and have any hope of trying to control what's happening, they must first let go of the illusion of control because that's the whole point of crypto. It's global. It doesn't uh, uh, set or sit under any particular jurisdiction. That is, that's going to be tough in any case. And sort of keep your regulations in the on-ramp and off-ramp level. Right. That's the, that would be the most efficient thing. And the other would be to take a tiny leap of faith. I know this is, uh, you know, this might be controversial to say, to take a tiny leap of faith and try to uh, adopt some of these technologies themselves. For instance, take India, for example. We are uh, in a very ambiguous uh, area when it comes to crypto regulations. But I think a good way of good port of entry, instead of allowing widespread currency trading, is to take tiny sandbox experiments and see if uh, crypto can be used either as an infusion of, of capital for a uh, you know for for an exploding uh, medium and uh, small and medium uh, industries uh, sector, or you know invite experiments like NBA top shots for uh, games like cricket, those kind of experiments where you can infuse crypto where you can keep control over it. You've got regulations around IP, and IP based regulations are a lot stronger there, and you can keep a tap on the money that flows in and out, rather than trying to approach this from a fiat angle because digital currency, cryptocurrency is not the same as digital currency, which is fiat right now. You can't apply the same rules or the same mental models there and expect it to work. Does that make sense? Yes. Makes sense. Very good explanation. I'm going to jump in here with one question that came from the audience that um, has me thinking about, is this an opportunity for jobs to be created and around the world? And I'm going to give you an example I gave you earlier. Um, about, I, I love the Golden State Warriors and Steph Curry, and I was watching the game last night, and they announced that they were going to have an NFT auction. And so I'm wondering, and the, the question from the audience was, uh, will we see brands start to use NFTs? Will they start to incorporate this into their businesses? Will we start to have um, NFT evangelists with inside corporations, um, leveraging the technology and the opportunity? I think that's inevitable, uh, Professor because uh, we've seen the effect it has and uh, experiments like uh, NBA Top Shots, I'm sorry, 
and uh, uh, the Formula One, Delta Time, Triple One game are prime examples of how brands can get into this space. But there is going to be a tiny difference though. The brands that will actually make it in this space need to look at NFTs as uh, not just a marketing tool, as in they can dip their toes in and get out, but try to form uh, some sort of a long-term relationship with, with not just a community by creating these economic ecosystems within there. So yeah, I think uh, there will be a lot of jobs in this space. And I mean that also in a broader sense, not you know a company hiring uh, a bunch of people to work on their NFTs. That of course will happen. But there is this uh, uh, ecosystem of uh, supplementary creators, people like myself, you know, journalists, writers, communicators, and um, you know, PR agents and so on, who might have very niche roles within the NFT space that they never had before because it was purely tech driven. Now it opens up a lot of possibilities. You can make movies in the NFT space and the entire crew for movie now has uh, access to this global crypto economy like never before. But where will these, I like to call them parallel universes because I, you know, I still exist very much so in the physical world as it relates to art. Where will the bridge be built? How will it be built? Can it be built? If it's, if it's digital and it needs to be logged on the blockchain, that's something that could never be done with a, with a physical painting or sculpture, could it? It could potentially, but then uh, where would you store the value? For instance, uh, I personally would uh, hold the NFT more valuable than a physical asset because it's not durable. It's not portable. It might break. Uh, I can't transport a you know four foot by uh, six foot painting uh, in an airplane, but this NFT that we bought, I can take it all over the world. I can you know access it through my phone or through a VR headset or anywhere else. I think that bridge already exists. Uh, you know, experience of art is one thing. It, it's it's only going to get more immersive the more time goes on, uh, Professor. I think uh, we're we're going to enjoy it more than we think we will. So I can assure you of uh, of that part. But uh, when it comes to this bridge between the real world and the uh, digital world or the crypto world, I think people like me are obvious examples. Look at my background. This is the space I've been given by my children today to, to work in and sort of live. The rest of the house uh, belongs to them. I mean, as we're as normal as uh, anybody else, right? Uh, we are, I'm hit by uh, COVID from the outside. I'm scared for my family. You know, I, uh, I eat uh, food that's too spicy sometimes. I, I, I'm rocking a dad bod. But in the metaverse, I'm something else. I'm able to express myself in a way that I'm not able to uh, in my physical space. And the cycle times for trying to achieve what you want to or trying to express yourself are becoming extremely quick in the in the crypto space. I've been a journalist or I mean a career communicator for, for about 13 years now, eight years or, or nine years of those were relatively very uneventful. Not, not to say I didn't see any amount of success. I made enough uh, uh, money I was getting by and all of that stuff, but nothing that would compare to uh, where I am today. And that's not because of any massive talent uh, on my side. I'm still the same person. It's just that this space is the new street. It's, it's a new global marketplace, uh, which the world is looking at now. So it only makes sense to sort of dip your toes into it and explore what you can do in it and how you can add value to it. And I, I read your blog earlier today, um, which I encourage everybody to read. Um, you and I, I'm going to ask Didi or one of the team members here to actually put that in the chat so that people can access that directly. But you were kind of a reluctant entrant into um, this space. Um, it took some time. The way I read the, the the way I read the blog. So it's just really interesting. What would you suggest? How would you suggest that people get started if they really are interested in NFT? Well, uh, if you're interested in NFTs as a whole, as a concept, you're already you're already there. You'd have gotten into the space. But if you have an interest in, say, uh, basketball, like uh, like like you, professor, you you can start with NBA Top Shots. If you're a racing aficionado, you get into Formula One Delta Times. If you're into gaming, you go into Sandbox or Axis Infinity. If you're into collectibles, you go to Gods Unchained, and so on. The point here is that there are areas of interest that you understand. You don't need to go out of your way to try and uh, you know grasp things that you didn't know before. That was my main uh, point of friction for the for the four years that I knew about crypto and refused to get in. I mean, the same packet of information in 2013 that uh, uh, Metacoven had gave him wings, and he became what he is. 
it left mm-hmm. me completely unaffected because mm-hmm. uh, I was a journalist at that time. And as a non uh, tech or a non financial journalist, we stay away from it. We keep away from it like the plague. That, that's kind of how uh, a journalist mind works. So it, it took me uh, a lot of meandering writing about financial technology and, and about supply chain finance and, and a lot of these spaces to, to grasp what he's talking about finally. But with the NFT space, you don't have that hassle. Start with what you love, start with what you understand. And then uh, all of these abstract concepts of inalienable ownership, of financial freedom, of alternative uh, financial instruments will sort of become infused uh, in what you do. They're part of the game, uh, to be honest. And a very quick uh, uh, story. Uh, I mean, this, this again is a pandemic story and a very important one to how crypto affects the real world. Job loss in the Philippines was, was massive. But this particular game, Axis Infinity, onboarded over a thousand people who lifted themselves out of poverty simply by playing this game. So they, earn, they, they play the game, they earn tokens by you know, winning or battling their uh, you know, digital creatures against one another. And those tokens are ERC-20 tokens, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Jigu, which can be then uh, redeemed into pesos. So that's how they lifted themselves out of uh, poverty. So these stories are very real. Uh, the, the learning curve isn't as steep as one might imagine when it comes to NFTs. So, you know, take a look around, browse around, uh, see what you love, and that's your opening. That's the beginning of the rabbit hole for you. And Subidor, before I turn it over to Jirgua and uh, uh, Matthew I, uh, for final comments, I just wanted to mention, I did see on your blog that you have um, $500,000 worth of fellowships available for people who are writing on this space. Is that still open for people to apply to, and because maybe some of our students in at Booth yes. and in the visual arts department at Chicago might be interested in learning more about that. Wow, yeah, the fellowship is not closed yet. Um, we we opened it up to uh, you know for about five uh, fellows. One part of that fellowship is now uh, uh, going towards a partnership with the with the NAS Academy. It's called the Crypto Creators Program. So the NAS Academy is is training, uh, finding and training fifty creators, YouTubers to tell stories from the metaverse. And yeah, we announced the metaverse fellowship uh, because we believe that's the, you know, that's the best way in which we can help this space in, in, in sort of uh, uh, talking about a lot of these uh, stories, not just origin stories, but stories like the one that I just told you about Philippines and all that. Uh, also the negative ones, at least people should, should know what they're getting into, uh, you know, from the beginning. So yeah, it's, it's, it's open, the link is available. Anybody that wants to apply and has an open mind about crypto, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I think that'll help this space a lot to just have more light shined on it and more stories told, whether they're good or bad. Um, so that, that's a fantastic thing that you're offering. And hopefully some of our students will, will take you up on uh, applying for it. Jirgua, I know you've got to go meet a student shortly. Any final comments? Are you convinced uh, with this space? Has Tubador done the, done the, done the job tonight? What are your thoughts? Are you there? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I muted myself a little bit, but I thanks to for, uh, you know, what you said, I think the half of them, I sort of expect that, but there are, let's say, you know, one third of it, probably I disagree, but two thirds of, you know, the rest of the half, I have one third, I, you know, I disagree, but the two thirds probably I will agree with you. Uh, which, which is a great conversation. Uh, there is something that I just just leave a little bit of the positive comments on it is that uh, I my, my, myself have a, some uh, you know similar age, but uh, they are very creative uh, and uh, they are arts they are artists. Unfortunately, not that much into the drawing, but the music, uh, and I can. I can feel they're des- you know, they're de- depressed, they're depressed by the environment, depressed by you know a lot of other things. And one of the important things that they just they didn't have the financial resource to keep to to support their work. Now, when I think about them and I think about what uh, this new stuff coming out, at least that uh, that's a distribution network, so that the people whoever. F- Find what they are working work is lovable. They can support them. So, to, from that perspective, I'm very much into 
into into into what uh, this this business model is doing. I hoping that you could uh, you know give the, the the final comments. I will still still be here uh, to give us a little bit of a direction that uh, in my mind any business any industry to get into especially a little bit together or a little bit or more together with the financial industry needs proper regulation needs proper eyes onto it otherwise you easily get into the disaster so if you could you could you know give us a little bit of the comment on what may how can you make this industry as healthy as possible so that more and more people uh, or more and more you know participants benefit from the unleashing the power of financial resources to the right artists, the right talent. That, right. Tubador, do you want to answer that? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I, okay. I, I can live with that mix, uh, Professor Jibu. The, the half that you agreed with and the one third you didn't, I, I think I can live with that. <laughs> I'm not going to push it further. Uh, but yes, I, I hear you on the regulations front. That is a cause for concern. Like I said, uh, you know, uh, any new industry and, and something as dynamic and fast evolving as the crypto space is going to raise some of these concerns. Uh, what I wanted to leave you with is that there are very conscious and conscientious efforts in trying to bridge this gap between regulation and what's going on. Uh, in the NFT space, uh, a lot of the, the models of engagement and transaction are, are, are very simplistic and clear. For instance, they are either based on IP rights or they are based on you know, simply buying and selling uh, uh, collectibles, digital collectibles, that's it. But when it comes to creating liquidity around NFTs, that's when things get uh, tricky. They get into uh, you know, more policy level discussions. And there are efforts uh, in the US right now, uh, you know, terming that any NFT backed uh, tokens will be com considered securities and so on. So these conversations are in place. I'm not saying there are easy answers to this, but there are at least existing conversations. And I think governments all over the world need to take a closer look at this and at least spark these conversations so that over the next four or five years, we, we get somewhere. Excellent, thank you. And Matthew, final comments, are you convinced? And any other final? I am 100% convinced that Tubador is the Andy Warhol of the NFT and there's no question who the ultimate artist of the NFT is. He's right here. Um, and I, I think the real question then becomes for me, um, if I had to game it out, just using art history as a guide, uh, the most important NFTs of the immediate future, long-term investment are the ones that are only problematically NFTs. Only the thing that is difficult to see and understand as an NFT will be a great NFT work of art is how I would guess this will play out. So mm -hmm. that will be the challenge of the NFT artist is how do you make something that is not just, just barely an NFT? And then, and then some people will just have a meta position. It's nice that you did the meta. So yeah, I'm yeah. convinced, whatever that means. I think I'm dead. Thanks, yeah. Professor. <laughs> That's right, keep that uh, funding model for the uh, writing open. Yeah, will do. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Ubedor, any, uh, any final comments? We'll give you the last word since this is a University of Chicago program. So we may have been a little rough on you today, but um, oh. <laughs> it's been fantastic. And I just wanted to say thank you. But any, any last words? Sure. I mean, uh, this has been an honor, uh, like I said, and uh, of this panel, obviously, and, and the misfit, but this is a privilege to be able to share at least a part of uh, uh, my journey and the perspective that, that I've learned, uh, not through any great effort, but simply by stumbling in on, on new technologies. And I think that's the biggest opportunity available to uh, the students right now. Uh, you know, it, it might seem a little, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, emotional, but the idea is that my, my father spent 27 years working in the same uh, company, uh, right? But his artistic talents went largely uh, unrecognized because there were no avenues uh, to do them. He's a hundred times as talented as I am. He's, he's a spontaneous poet and a singer in Tamil, a native language. There were no avenues open to him. And uh, by the time he figured out that he could 
quit his day job. He was very good at it and, and move on. It was 30 years into his life. It took me 13 years of meandering as opposed to 27 years of his to figure out that this is where I belong in the NFT space. You don't need to uh, meander even for three years or two years now. There are avenues available to you. And I'd say the idea is to not uh, think about life or uh, you know uh, making money or trying to pursue your career in a linear fashion anymore. That won't work. You need to look at uh, uh, all of these new technologies that are around you and not think about you know platitudes like follow your passion and you do well. No, follow where you can add the most value. Which space can you add the most value? And right now, the way I see it, the NFT space opens up a lot of those doors. There are possibilities that you can explore today and still, uh, you know, sort of uh, do what you want to. So uh, I, it might have been a, a, a bit of a, uh, a random comment, but I think that's that's important. Uh, the, the underlying aspect of that is obviously that uh, I do not have a lot of faith in the in the fiat system as it runs. And we do need to hedge our bets uh, in the future. I mean, uh, everybody that has assets today gets richer. Everybody that has cash gets progressively uh, poorer. So we need uh, uh, to bank on, uh, you know, uh, at least creative directions on assets and career paths that sort of uh, hedge this risk for us in some point. And I think crypto is an excellent uh, medium to do that. Dubador, thank you so much for those comments. Uh, I think it's great that you ended that on that note because so many of our students and young people need to hear those, those points from somebody like you and from our professors. So Tubador and uh, Professor Jackson and Professor Ho, thank you so much for the lively discussion this evening. This conversation is guaranteed to help the audience better understand NFTs from buyers and um, their perspective. Uh, thank you so much. Our next program will feature selling platforms. That's next week on Thursday night. And it will include Christie's who auctioned Beeple's work to Tubador. Professor Randy Krosner from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business will moderate that program to help us further understand the long-term viability of NFT art and where we're headed with this whole phenomenon. Um, finally, uh, one note, uh, one and a half degrees is our program on sustainability and climate change will return in the coming weeks with several really interesting episodes focused on oceans with the University of Chicago Marine Biological Laboratory. So please visit our website, www.uchicago.hk for further information on the dates and times. And good night, stay safe, especially if you're in India. <laughs>